Seven Secrets of the Goddess by Devdutt Patanayak Chapter 2 Kali's Secret Nature is indifferent to human gaze Part 1 Kali is perhaps the most dramatic form of Devi in Hindu mythology. She is naked, with hair unbound, standing or sitting on top of Shiva, sickle in hand, with a garland of male heads around her neck, her blood-stained tongue stretching out. Is that tongue directed at us? Or are we just witnesses? Does she give that tongue meaning? Or do we? To understand Kali, it makes sense to appreciate the rise of Devi worship in India. And for that, we have to appreciate the transformation of Hinduism over 4,000 years from the pre-Buddhist Vedic phase of Hinduism, where rituals were more important than gods, devas, through the post-Buddhist Puranic phase of Hinduism, when devotion to God, Bhagwan, gained paramount importance, to the rise of colonial gaze and the native reaction to it. During this journey, we shall see how the idea of Kali is more ancient than the name and form that we today associate with her. We shall also see how Kali's tongue transformed from being a weapon to the symbol of wisdom, to the symbol of shame. Around 2500 BCE, before Common Era, formerly known as BC or before Christ, a city-based civilization thrived along the Indus and Saraswati rivers. The latter dried out by 2000 BCE. Here we find clay figures of naked but bejeweled women alongside images of clay bulls. The bulls represent untamed male virility. The women, with their jewels, are representations of nature that has been domesticated. Together, they represent nature's fertility over which humans seek control for their material welfare. We do not find any Kali-like images, but we do find an appreciation of the conflict between the wild and the tame. These cities ceased to exist by 2000 BCE, but their cultural practices continued to thrive and spread in the Indian subcontinent. Around 1500 BCE, a cattle herding people migrated from the Indus Saraswati River basins to the Gangetic River basin. Their relationship with the Indus cities has yet to be resolved. Their hymns, known as the Vedas, reveal a great yearning for cows, horses, grain, gold, and sons. With fire, Agni, as their medium, they invoke virile warrior gods like Indra and other masculine denizens who reside in the sky more frequently than earth-bound goddesses. But there is reference to one Nirriti, who is acknowledged but asked to stay away for the sake of health and prosperity. Her name means one who disrupts Riti, or the regular rhythms of nature. Around 1000 BCE, Brahmana literature that link hymns to rituals elaborate on the nature of Nirriti. She is described as dark and disheveled, associated with the southern regions, which is traditionally linked with death. This Nirriti is often identified as a proto-Kali, especially since Kali is often addressed in later literature as Dakshina Kali, she who comes from the south, south being the land of Yama, god of death. Nirriti embodies the human discomfort with the dark side of nature. In German near Brahmana, there is the story of one Dirgha Jeevi, she of the long tongue, who licked away the Soma created during a yagna, much to Indra's irritation. This Soma gave everyone, the Devas included, long lives, happiness and health. Indra sends a young man called Sumitra to overpower her. But Dirgha Jeevi rejects the man as he has just one manhood, while she has many vulvas seeking satisfaction. So Indra gives that man many manhoods. Seeing Sumitra transform thus, Dirgha Jeevi is much pleased. They make love. Pinned down during the act of sex, Dirgha Jeevi is momentarily immobilized, giving Sumitra the opportunity to kill her. This is also identified as a proto-Kali due to the references to the tongue and unbridled sexuality. It reveals male anxiety before female sexual and reproductive prowess. Around 500 BCE, 
Buddhism and other Shraman, ascetic traditions, which rejected the materialistic obsessions of society, grew. Words like karma and moksha gained popularity. There was talk of meditation and bondage and freedom. The yagna gradually went out of favor. It is at this time that the name Kali appears for the first time in early Upanishad literature. But it is the name given to one of the many tongues of Agni, the fire god. In later iconography, we do find images of Kali with flames for hair. One can only speculate if the flame called Kali is in any way linked to the Kali with flames for hair. The post-Buddhist period saw the gradual rise of Puranic literature. This literature spoke of a single, all-powerful divine entity or God who comes to the rescue of devotees. Different people visualized God differently. For some, the supreme being was Shiva, the hermit. For others, it was Vishnu, the householder. And for still others, it was the goddess Devi. Each school of thought vied for supremacy. Accordingly, stories came into being of how Devi vanquished Asuras that neither Shiva nor Vishnu could defeat. Amongst Devi's many manifestations were Kali and Kali-like goddesses. Shiva, Vishnu and Devi and their many forms can be traced to Vedic literature, while others to Grama Devas or village gods of India, where oral traditions perhaps predate the oldest Vedic hymns. Appropriation of Grama Devas into more mainstream codified religions was common in this period. And so, it is not uncommon to find similar gods and goddesses in Buddhist, Jain and Hindu mythology that became more elaborate during this period. The earliest stories of the Puranas are found in the epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, dated between 300 BCE and 300 CE. In them, we find a goddess called Kalaratri appearing on the final night of the battle at Kurukshetra, when Ashwatthama ruthlessly murders the sons of the Pandavas at night when they are asleep. In Tamil Sangam literature, composed around this time, we come across the goddess Koravai with flames for hair, associated with battlefields. Both Kalaratri and Koravai are Kali-like goddesses associated with rage and violence. From around 300 CE, when the early Puranas were put together, Kali appears as a discreet goddess. She is born from the locks of Shiva's hair along with her brother, Virabhadra, and together they attack and destroy Daksha's Yagna. In the Devi Mahatmya, which is a part of the Markandeya Purana, she is born from Durga's forehead to kill the demons Chanda and Munda. The Devi Mahatmya also retells Kali's most famous tale involving her tongue. An Asura called Rakta Bij had obtained a boon from Brahma that if a drop of his blood, Rakta in Sanskrit, fell on the ground, it would transform into a seed, Bij, and sprout a duplicate of himself. No Deva was able to defeat Rakta Bij. Any attempt to strike him with weapons only made matters worse. So the Devas led by Indra went to Brahma, who expressed his helplessness and directed them to Vishnu. Vishnu also expressed helplessness and directed them to Shiva. Shiva also expressed helplessness and appealed to the goddess. And the goddess rode into battle in two forms. The first form was of the multi-armed Chandi on a tiger, ready to do battle. The second was Kali of outstretched tongue. Chandi struck the many Rakta beaches with her weapons, beheading them. Kali drank each Raktabij's blood before it fell on the ground. Thus, no duplicate Raktabij was created and the Asura was killed. The goddess made a garland of the Asura's many heads and wore them as adornment. Around 500 CE, Tantric literature began to be composed. Unlike the Puranas, which seemed more interested in the external world and in matters such as devotion and pilgrimages, the Tantras were more interested in the occult and alchemy. Here we find Kali and Kali-like goddesses such as Tara, Chamunda or Chinnamastika appearing with increasing frequency as part of a collective of 3, 7, 9, 10, 64 goddesses variously known as Tridevi, Triambika, 
matrikas, mahavidyas and yoginis. These collectives include benevolent and fecund goddesses alongside also malevolent and morbid goddesses. While these goddesses are also mentioned in the Puranas, their nature is elaborated on in the Tantras, which reveals a deeper appreciation of nature, sex and violence. These goddesses embody folk deities associated with wild and domesticated spaces and were gradually incorporated into Puranic and Tantric, even Buddhist, literature. In the Mahabharat, we hear of Shiva's son Skanda informing a group of such wild female deities that if they are not worshipped and respected, they have the freedom to harm pregnant women and children. In Buddhist literature, we hear of a child-devouring female demon called Hariti who is transformed into a child protecting female demon by the Buddha. By 1000 BCE, Kali emerges out of the collective and starts being seen as an independent goddess. In the Kalika Purana, she is the perfect, most primal representation of the goddess. Some address this Kali as Mahakali to distinguish her from other Kalis. What distinguished her from all other goddesses was her nakedness. Her unbound hair, her thirst for blood, her unbridled lust, her outstretched tongue and that she dominated a male form identified as Shiva or Bhairav. She either had one foot on him, stood on him or sat on him. But he is not a demon she has defeated. He is identified as her husband, one whom she awakens. She is the goddess who makes him God. By this time, when Hinduism is marked by the rise of vast temple complexes, Devi is identified with nature and Kali with the most primal form of nature, before culture and outside culture, unaffected by rules and opinions of humanity. She is power, raw and elemental, both venerable and frightening. Human society is created within her. She ultimately consumes Human Society Chapter 2 Kali's Secret Nature is indifferent to human gaze Part 2 Chapter 2 Kali's Secret Nature is indifferent to human gaze Part 3 